All right. So welcome everyone to uh, our business showcase. We're going to be discussing personalization and Drupal, uh, which is actually a topic that I think will appeal to almost any brand, any business, any industry. And so what we tried to do is assemble uh, a panel of experts that are kind of on the forefront of using personalization in a Drupal context. Uh, we have Lee Hammond from Interscope Records, Aaron Peterson from Time Inc., and Mike Lamb from Pfizer. So sort of representing a good cross-section of uh, B2C, B2B, and MEP, media entertainment business. Uh, my name is David Menny. I'm part of the Acquia Lyft product team uh, at Acquia, which is our personalization offering. What I thought I'd do is kind of kick off today a little bit around just the fundamentals of personalization, some things to keep in mind, uh, and especially why Drupal is particularly well suited, sort of a more open approach to bringing data together and using that to um, more effectively target consumers, customers, uh, and get people the right content and information. And then what we'll do is sort of move into a panel format. So in order to sort of tap into the, to the brain trust we have up here, uh, we'll have a couple of uh, seed questions to kick things off, but definitely want to keep things interactive. So if there, are, if there are questions that come up as we go through, especially in the panel section, um, yeah, feel free to use the mic that's in the center here, and, and we'd love to, uh, to have you ask anything that's on your mind. All right, so we're going to start off with sort of a what is personalization, why it's important, and why an open approach really matters. Um, and then we'll sort of dig into each one of the customers we have here and sort of uh, get a sense of how they're using Drupal today, uh, how they're using personalization, what kinds of things they're thinking about uh, doing now and in the future. And then we'll open it up after that for questions from you guys. So just sort of starting off on a what is personalization. I think most, uh, most industries, most teams across a variety of different businesses have fairly common challenges, albeit their uses of personalization may be completely different. But the fact is it's all around getting uh, a quality volume of content produced and in front of the right type of user. As we know, people evaluating products on a typical website built in Drupal, there are technical evaluators looking for more technical content. There might be marketing users looking for the business value or the impact of a particular product uh, towards their business. Serving them the right content and at the right time in their buying journey is one of the key reasons why personalization can really, uh, can really help. It's obviously about delivering a great digital experience. Drupal's phenomenally well suited to cutting edge digital experiences, but it's also more than just the web, right? And this is another uh, area where Drupal can really help take some of the insights gathered from someone interacting with a web page and then be able to serve them content across different channels. So maybe it's a targeted email campaign, maybe it's uh, interconnection through a social uh, metaphor, could be even shifting context, context to something like a call center. So when someone's searching for content on a website that they aren't finding, how do you be more proactive in terms of shifting the context from the web conversation maybe to a call center conversation because you know that person may call in for some additional detail. Segmentation is also an incredibly important starting point and a, an incredible uh, important piece of success around a personalization story. It's really helping understand what your audience is doing when they come to the site. Um, it's one thing to say people are logging into the site and we know who they are because they purchase products or things of that nature. But what about anonymous users, right? And most of the traffic coming to a typical website, these people aren't logging in, they're not identifying themselves, they're not filling out forms. But they may be doing research, they may be looking at products, they may be trying to educate themselves, they could even be constituents coming to a, a local government site looking for information. So how do we make sure that we can create an experience that's compelling to them, that's engaging for them, that serves them the right information. That's really one of the goals of personalization as well. So when I really boil it down, it's these three things, and we feel sort of in this order, that understanding your audience, and sort of building up that unified customer profile about what your audience is doing on the site, what content they're consuming, how they got there, um, and anything including the real-time data that's available, for example, what time of day it is, what geolocation they're in, 
what kind of device they're coming to the site with. So if that's a smartphone, a tablet, if they're coming through a laptop, all this stuff can be really critical in deciding what content to present them. The segmentation that I mentioned is, is key. Um, anyone who um, is looking at segmenting an audience typically looks at a known audience, right? So like for people that have responded to an email campaign or have you know, bought a product from us before, that's the easy group of people to segment. The anonymous traffic is even more important to segment. So really understanding who's coming to the site, who's your highest value customers, what kind of content are you gonna present them? And once you understand the audience, you understand the segments, then you can actually start optimizing that site. So whether that's through more behavioral targeting, understanding what a user is doing, sort of anticipating the journey that they're on and then presenting content to them at the right point in that journey, or doing something like running an A-B test or a multivariate test uh, to sort of test content and messaging and to see what resonates with that audience. So those are kind of the three pillars of personalization uh, that, that we see. So you guys are probably seeing the eye strain chart. Scott Brinker is famous for um, the chief MarTech technology landscape. Bottom line, there is an absolute ton of marketing technology that's available, roughly 1,800 different uh, systems and platforms that are available today. And Drupal is incredibly well suited to connecting with these systems out of the box, right? Because there's generally more modules more agility in the Drupal community to connect to these systems and, and, the, and the series of modules available to connect these systems is freely available. But then when you go into an omni-channel world, again, looking at the website and personalizing the website, but then looking at other channels as well. So while Drupal is incredibly well suited and you can do a lot at the JavaScript layer, interconnecting different data sources to make choices on the website, it's also really important to have rich APIs and the ability to do sort of system to system uh, connections. Uh, things like marketing automation tools uh, where a lot of demand gen and lead gen marketers live, um, CRM systems which are important to the sales force. It's your record of your customer base and bringing the data from these systems together to build an even richer profile of that customer. So starting off with basically um, anonymous traffic moving through to a known user and then augmenting the data from existing systems that you have. That really sort of builds the richest possible profile. And the advantage is that all of the teams within your business can rally around that single integrated view, right? Um, I think digital marketers traditionally um, are closest to the website and having a good understanding of what content is consumed on that site is important but there's lots of marketing teams. There's lots of, lots of people that have a shared interest in what that customer is doing, including your sales force. How do you get a shared view? It's by federating that data together in a single spot. So just sort of looking at the journey, right? Typically, customers coming to a website are gonna be clicking on a content, coming there via keywords, coming there through search engines, maybe responding to an email campaign that you send out but they're still relatively anonymous to you, right? At some point, they're gonna sign up for a newsletter, they're gonna add their email address to a form for more information, they might buy a product. When you have some unique identifier, they kind of move into that known world. And you can kind of merge the anonymous tracking that you've done of that user with their known identifier, which you can then use as a key into the other data sources that you might have in the enterprise, right? And using Drupal to bring that information together. So it's all around building that unified customer profile. And as we go down from your most traffic being anonymous users to the more detailed traffic at the bottom, it, it's basically that continuum uh, that personalization can really help with. As I mentioned, it's not just the website and it is really, really important to make sure that you're grabbing the insight from all the channels and the touch points that your customers are interacting with you around. Sure, the web is probably where most people are doing their primary research, but again, are they coming through mobile devices primarily? Are, is there a certain tendency or a time of day or a certain point in their journey that they use a different kind of device or interact with you in a different way? And how do you optimize the experience to that? So if you look at a typical journey map, I mean, these things are pretty complex, right? They're multi-channel. 
there's a, a bunch of different touch points that a customer will have with your particular site and with your particular brand at any given point. And bridging that anonymous visitor traffic with the known user systems that you have is really sort of the goal uh, that personalization has and why Drupal is really well suited to sort of bringing and bridging those worlds together and those channels together. So the unified customer profile was the first pillar. The second piece is really around segmentation. So this is really understanding what your audience is doing through the behavior that they exhibit. Because again, if you know who they are, that's one thing. If you don't, because they're not telling you who they are, it's only through behavior that you're going to understand what they're really up to. So being able to track some basic situational data, where they are, what time of day it is, things like that. Um, behavioral data in terms of how often they come back to the site. When they come back, how long do they spend? What kind of content do they look at? What kind of interest do they have? And bridging that on to uh, more of a multi-channel profile in terms of what else are they doing on social channels? What do we know about them from our CRM system? Um, have they contacted our call center for help previously? Things like that. Then the third pillar is optimization. So once you have the data collected, once you have an understanding of what your audience is doing and what sort of segments they fall into, how do you use that data? How do you make it actionable? Right? So it's, it's all around surfacing that information in the analytics tools that most of your teams are probably already using. Right? So that could be something like GA, Google Analytics. That could be integrated reporting within the Drupal environment. Or it could be direct access to the data that's being collected. I think that's a really important tenet is keeping that data open and making sure that you can access it uh, in a unified way is also really important because otherwise, while we're sort of breaking down the data silos of where all this customer information is, you don't want to have reporting silos on top of that, right? Because if you have to look at 15 different places to figure out what your customer is doing, it doesn't make you very agile and doesn't make you sort of able to take, take advantage of the best opportunities. So there are different reporting and analytics strategies, but these are the ones that we definitely see, uh, we see most often. And then, of course, if you understand your audience and what they're up to, then running a directed test, like an A-B test or a multivariate test, definitely something that a lot of people are looking to do in a personalization context. But running a test to a general audience, generally not that effective. Like asking the world, do you like this better or this better, um, generally doesn't give you a statistically significant result. But once you understand your audience segments, if you run tests against those segments, then you're generally getting a, a very relevant result and, and usually much quicker as well. So that's kind of the process that we see most of our customers take uh, when they're tackling personalization, especially uh, within their Drupal site. So I wanted to pause there in case there are any questions just on the fundamentals, but what I wanted to do is sort of shift gears to the panel, um, introduce our speakers and sort of dig in more around how they're using Drupal today and what they sort of see the promise of personalization within their, uh, within their respective companies. So if that's okay, any questions at this point? No? Great. All right, Lee. Can love to hear who you are and what you're up to. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Is this perfect, thank you. So I'm uh, Lee Hammond, I work at Interscope Records. Uh, that's home of a lot of artists I'm sure you know, Lady Gaga, Eminem, Maroon 5. Imagine Dragons. So I manage the official properties for those artists in Eminem.com, LadyGaga.com. Uh, these are umbrella marketing sites and more and more becoming direct e-commerce sites as well. It's a, we're, that's something we're adding to the mix. Um, and to sort of speak to one of the problems that we wanted to solve with Drupal was the managing a big portfolio of sites. At scale, and this is a high-touch, high-brand business. So, each of my artists wants a snowflake, and I need to make it appear like I have to have a machine behind me to make snowflakes. So, I do feel like Drupal, multi-site Drupal, is the products we use a lot here to make that a possibility and a reality. Um, and so, uh, you know, that sort of framework as Akio rolled out personalization with that landed with a couple of other things that we've been spending our time on. I mean, honestly, 
the music experience for bands is so fragmented that the artist side is sort of a catch-all, which should be a good thing, but oftentimes we don't really know why you're here. Are you here for the tour? Because again, and it, and it is, in fact, not only is it a catch-all, I work with a recording label, but I'm one of the business partners to an artist. We sell her Lady Gaga's recordings. She has a separate merch company, and a separate booking agent, and endorsements. And yet we are the emissaries for her brand, and fans want to come find out a lot of different things there. So in some ways, I'm using Lyft to just ask a basic question. Why are you here? Do you want to buy something? Do you want to, and also, I want to, do you want to buy a t-shirt? Do you want to buy tickets? Do you want to look at some videos? Do you want to look at some photos? Uh, the learnings do match. Then combine that with, I also want to tell marketing, what you want them to do is not maybe not what they want to do. And this has allowed us to say, we all know that we only get, that one of our revenue streams is when they buy the new album at iTunes or, or at Target. But when the context for these users is they're coming to an artist site, they're probably, what I've learned is they probably know where iTunes is, but they're coming to the site for a different experience. But I have to tell, even internally, and I think this is going to be just a, a little bit of conversations here with Lyft, our Lyft cohorts, is that it's as much about personalizing the experience for the user coming to the site as it is teaching our internal marketing team, you've got new tools here. You have to think differently. You have to, um, you know, what, and so for me, I just want to make sure what I s gave you for slides is what I'm talking about. Um, it's good so far. Yeah. yeah. So. Those are the kind of my learnings, and then, and we're starting with very lightweight cases. Like I said, why are you here? And doing multivariate testing, is this working? And I'll give you a couple ad hoc examples where we took a carousel of, of hero banners that were loading up and turned them into persistent randomized testing. And the one that we had thought was the going to be the winner, the iTunes banner on street day, nobody cared about that. The video that was two months old was still the winner. Even, and that, that sort of surprised me. I, I guess it's media, but we thought, well, that video's played out. Uh, so I, I like to say to marketing, this is sort of having a dance. People <laughs> want to come into the company. They'll buy. And again, we will all make money when we have more fans engaged with the brand. We don't have to draw a direct line and quickly have them leave the site. So I need more data like that. I think we're still in early days here. Um, and even in the case where the number one thing is driving something, I then want to say, well, let's try three different creatives. Let's figure out a different way to uh, work with that. Um, and then when it comes down to the next level, personalization is great. I, I know where you live, and I know this artist is coming there the next two weeks. Here's a concert, highly relevant. The more we can extract the name of the local venue, even better. Um, and then because we know a device, we, we know that an I iPhone user is going to be an iTunes user or an Android user. Well, most likely could be a Google Play user, you know, but we can customize in that regard. And then as we get that anonymous to know, we know you're a male or female, that's where we could have some, I mean, I, this is definitely like a walk, run, and I feel like this is like a run. Okay, we're gonna get creative for male or female. We're gonna do different things because we know that. Um, we are also doing something I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, but when we do register users, we are, um, Registering them with social profiles, and that can be Facebook and Twitter. And then we are expanding on that insight about that user and asking their permission to say, "Can we look at other artists you like on Facebook, on Twitter, on?" on and that's giving us a really 360 view of you as a music consumer. I know you came to this artist site as an Eminem fan, and I could maybe expand genres. But if I look at your social profile, I know exactly which charts, and it will definitely go beyond hip hop. And so I have a one-to-one -one view of like these artists. And then in Interscope as a music company and Universal as a big parent company, we are using that data to talk to music consumers and make sure that they're putting our music and our artists in, in, and, speak and staying relevant throughout the cycle. So that's, um, I would definitely say that's the most aspirational part of that. Uh, before I hand it off to you, Mike, I Get to that. I did. I did find some affinity with one of your guys in that. Um, uh, you know, we are working with very narrow brands. I'm working on artist sites, so there is some limited things. To, I may know you love Katy Perry, but I can't really use that in your context. I'm sure you have a lot of drug brands. 
can't cross the North Bay. Right. And that's, but anyhow, that's, these are all sort of, these are nice problems to have, and they're down the road if you want to pick these. That's, that's probably the low hanging fruit for the, our, our, uh, on that one. So. Yeah, we can dig in a little more around that, because uh, I think that's a big topic. But uh, Mike, did you want to give us a little bit of an uh, idea what Pfizer's up to? Sure. So on the, uh, actually, I'll, I'll do my Drupal intro. So Pfizer has been using Drupal as our standard technology for building web applications for, for about three years now. So beginning of 2012, we said, this is just our standard now. And at that point, we had about 60 systems that we consolidated. So we spent a lot of time just consolidating some different content management systems into one platform. Again, just like Lee, people want Snowflake. Uh, we built about 1,200 assets over the last, actually the last two of those two years. And we tried not to build 1,200 Snowflakes again, right? So a lot of efforts just in building in to try and consolidate this and, and convince brand managers that the thing that we want is actually not completely different from the thing somebody else wants. We can put these newer capabilities in place and then use them across, across the platform. So on the platform itself, we've, we've benchmarked to be 40% faster and 60% cheaper than those previous approaches. We consolidated those platforms and now we have 86 brands and 40, 40 markets on Drupal, right? So this is a really good foundation for us to say, we have this capability, we've saved a bunch of money by consolidating it, we can build websites pretty fast, let's take it to the next level and, and build some new capabilities. And of course, personalization is, is top of that agenda. Um, what I'd say is kind of similar to what, what you were talking about there is, we built 1,200 properties, right? This isn't Pfizer.com, one big property that's on Drupal and that's it. That's 1,200 individual individual properties, and then a lot of content within them. So if you imagine if you're a, a customer of Pfizer with lots of different types of customer, trying to navigate that to get the right content for you is, can be challenging. So that's what we're trying to trying to address here is if you want to come to us or if we're if we're marketing to you, at least make sure that we're, we're getting you to the right place and we're giving you really good content that's, that's going to transform your experience. Um, so what did I get off that? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> 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 So focus on a far, far greater relevance of, of content for the user. So an example would be if we're doing, if we're doing email marketing, right? So if we're, if we're marketing content to, to a user, we want to, of course, fo focus on making that relevant and personalizing it. And that's not a dear Mike rather than whatever it is. It's really use the data we have on that person to, 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 to make it relevant. Um, if we're sending someone an email, we probably have some data on them already. We have some, some things we can use. And if you have that, there's a whole bunch more you can first stage of what we're trying to do is it's simple things that users are going to expect. If you receive an email from Pfizer and we've managed to do a good job and personalize it for, for you, if you click on one of the links in, in that email and as you're talking about this different systems are crossing across, across here, don't let them click on that link and then think that you're completely irrelevant to them, right? That's, that's not going to give somebody a good user experience and sometimes crossing across the different systems can, can be challenging, but using some of the technology we're talking about here, you can make that a lot easier. So figure out multi-channel, lots of different channels we can focus on. Right now, we're, we're focusing on web with Drupal because we have a lot of Drupal, and we were doing email marketing. So these are key focus areas. Pfizer have lots of different customers. We have healthcare professionals who might be prescribing our products. We have patients who might be taking those products. We've got caregivers of people who might be taking one of our products. We have consumer brands, so Chapstick, and, and these kind of things have a completely different, uh, diff different audience. So across those different types of audiences, and different types of users, we have to use very many, many different options and strategies. If you imagine Chapstick being at one end of the scale, someone might turn up at chapstick.com from the Facebook page, who knows who they are. Uh, we, can, we can try some things there. On the other end of the scale, we work in lots of different markets. In many of those markets, uh, we visit our web pharmacies uh, and see information on pharmaceuticals. We have to validate that we're a healthcare professional. So that actually gives us, it, it's always been a challenge is, a huge barrier. So if somebody wants to visit one of our websites in that situation, they've got to really invest in registering, including hiring a professional, a trusted professional, before seeing the content. So hopefully now we can take take that and say, okay, we've invested, you've, you've given us some data, we can actually use that. So, so once you're in, we can actually give something that's relevant to you rather than you're in and now you get to hope that's the right property that you're after, and then you know, good luck finding the content. That's the hope. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Mike. And I guess uh, just to round out things here, Aaron, what is your perspective from, from timing? 
what are you guys? So at Pi Day, we are roughly where Five Days is from 2013. We started just over a year ago. We do all of our worldwide sites through Google. We have we also have 36 brands worldwide. Just to net it out. Speak the language. Speak the language. <laughs> the 86 <laughs> brand club up here. Yeah. We have 86 <laughs> brands worldwide, and we have 50 uh, we have 50 teams scattered over here. So my core experience is with four different locations, and for us. We think the people needs that we have a consistent framework with which we can um, with which we can approach the experience that we're building for our audiences. And when we think about our audiences at Pine, we think both about the end user audiences, which are people who are coming to us for content, and also our editorial teams. We believe very strongly that our editorial teams are users as well, and that we have to think about their needs as being primary alongside the needs of our of our third party audiences. When about personalization at Pine, we think about it from the perspective of a media company where in the U.S. roughly <coughs> half of all U people in the U.S. will visit a Pine brand at any given month, where we have over 100 million unique visitors worldwide every month, and where our portfolio of brands ranges well beyond what people typically think of when they think of Pine People and Pine Magazine and Sports Illustrated, all the way over through Sunset and Rugby World and uh, Southern Living. When we think about our audiences then, we think about, we have this audience, this audience, most people in this room, like raise your hand, did you read Pine Magazine when you were in elementary school? Yeah, we all read Pine Magazine. We don't necessarily all read Pine Magazine today. So how do we go ahead and how do we provide that experience that people are used to coming to major news weeklies to get? How do we provide that context and that real news? And being able to inform the, the content that we provide our audiences is very important. If, for example, you are a Sunset user and you're going to come and look on Sunset for content, it's very, very useful for you if we know the temperature zone that you're living in, if we have some of the basic weather information about where you're living so that we can serve up content that is incrementally more relevant for you. And for us, personalization takes the form not necessarily of how can we send in more stuff, but how do we craft an engaging content experience that really gives you what you're looking for? that allows you to engage more in discovery and less engagement in search metrics and data that we share. And from an editorial perspective, our ability to forecast what our editorial team wants with their finger tips and put that right in the CMS makes it easier for our editorial team to, to create experiences and curate experiences, whether those are content or whether those are video or uh, whatever files or images that they're creating, and get those uh, pieces together and get that content right in front of audiences who really appreciate and the team is really going to get into it. The way that we're using personalization today is in its far west venture, which we were talking a bit about just before. As a company, we have we have a lot of uh, data and information around our audiences, and that helps us paint a picture and an understanding of who our audiences are, both as individuals and as groups. And the challenge for us now is how do we take that understanding of who our audiences are and then apply that towards giving them that content experience and that very personal and very unique touch. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's great. So we're all at different uh, we're all at different points of entry kind of to the personalization story. So I wanted to sort of kick off the panel with some of the results or early results or at least benefits or impacts that you've seen personalization having. So we've talked about, you know, some of the things that can help sort of stitch data together and things like that. But what's what have you seen as help you guys move the needle in your respective businesses, or what do you anticipate it'll help most with? And, it, and anyone can jump in with whatever. So I'd, I'd jump in to say, excuse me, when we started out with personalization, we were, we were very excited um, when, when these products started to mature, especially when they were built into, uh, built into Drupal. We were very excited about the potential, and we, we went and spoke to lots of people about what could happen with this, and we, we read a lot of research. And there was one cooking cook I think we were talking about, there was a piece of Juniper research that said uh, an email that is personalized built at the end, uh, targeted content to a particular user, is 19 times, or drives 19 times more engagement than just one <coughs> just a blast email, right? So we were quoting some of these statistics in the case, and then we tried a few pilots, and there was this bit in the middle where we were very nervous, we were just like, okay, we quoted that this is what, what could happen, and what really does happen? And we, it was representative of those numbers. Which it drives a lot of interest in continuing and continuing this. It is hard to do. Like there's, we were mm -hmm. talking about the marketers and the, their abilities to understand and implement these technologies, but it's hard to do on a large scale. 
but the numbers that we've seen are definitely in line with uh, with published research and some very impressive you know, uh, uptake and, and engagement on the content. Fantastic. Actually, on that front, I don't know if you guys have anything else in the depth uh, around results, but uh, one of the things I want to dig into too is just around the sort of the the culture of optimization or getting teams to kind of think about how to do this on an ongoing basis. Because I know if it's just to set it and forget it, it's probably not going to drive any meaningful results over time. So it's really doing it in a prescribed and iterative way. Um, so I'd love to hear more around, you know, time and at, at the Interscope, what you guys have found effective. Mm -hmm. So I think we brought it up when we were speaking, and I think that was a really good way to start again. When, from an engineering perspective, we decide that we're going to deploy mechanisms to allow teams to engage in search and innovation, it's not a matter of building a feature and just shipping a feature. Putting that tool, putting that feature out there within a corporate environment means that roles all around you change. And what people can do and how they can compete with that and how they, how your peers within the organization find success begins to change. You gave a really good example of how it used to be about reaching and thinking about who the original line of customers and getting them to engage in conversion, but it's really about how do you build that rich relationship that someone's ready to buy it, and then you know that they're just ready to act, and you know that they're on a high team, then what can you put in front of them that allows them to engage more deeply and think about it again, and not feel as though, as someone who's really, really passionate about what we buy that, that you're just trying to sell them that end user journey, that you really are being purposeful about how you're approaching it. From the perspective of time, that means that as we roll out the ability to engage in innovation, as we have teams do begin to do algorithmic generated internally understand how to use these tools. It completely changes your workflow. And it can, can change workflow in a way that can be very nerve-wracking. So you, for example, on Toil, you know, a lot of times the editorial teams hear personalization, and what they interpret it to be is, you're going to have machines start to figure out what content goes out in front of audiences. I think we've all been in a position where we've had an algorithmically generated assessment of what content we want to see in front of us at any given moment. And it isn't as powerful as the assessment of an editor in terms of this is something that will really engage you for this audience or this block of audience to get. I'm just going to make a point because mm -hmm. I, I know how much, I would imagine if I'm at time and it's really the stuff that needs going and somebody hits personalization and it's going to get a very quick buzz feed and that's what the time we would get. Are we just going to oh, add? sorry. Sorry, I was, okay. I was just saying that if I was at the re at, if I was a journalist from Time Inc. and I hear personalization, mm -hmm. you're gonna you're gonna take us down to BuzzFeed or Huffington Post where you're just gonna append side boob shot to every headline and <laughs> massive click through. I'm not really <laughs> known for that, but we can run with it. No, no, no. I know you're not. I'm say I'm just I'm sorry if that's an <laughs> off color joke. I just mean I, Huffington that's Post. Right. Huffington Post started as a legitimate news publication and then right. they just followed the consumer to their lowest common denominator, and, and yet you, there was something right in what they were doing. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, just that it, there is a line here about where, journal, where, where you can't ruin the brand with um, chasing. Uh, oh, absolutely, and, and, and for those who aren't aware, I used to work at AOL, I used to work at the Huffington Post team. Uh, certainly there was a period in 2009, 2010 where these tools were rudimentary tools, and the manner in which they were applied were at best primitive, but I think now if you go to a Huffington Post or if you go to a BuzzFeed, perhaps a Sun, you are going there with an expectation that the content that is going to be put in front of you is probably going to be of interest to you. Uh, the elections are coming up, for example, and you want to be going to the election sites, you want to be going to news sites, you want to be getting, at the very least, election results that are personalized in the sense that they're derivative of my local voting session, not necessarily some new site that's going to come up. The teams that we work with at Time are you know, among the best and longest standing best editorial teams that are available. If you look at the team at Time Magazine, for example, if you look at the team at Sports Illustrated, they're never going to be in a position where they're going to be letting content be generated algorithmically or even uh, putting the engineering team, certainly in terms of <coughs> the decision making and moving around content in front of them. But if you're on the Sports Illustrated team and you have the opportunity to have populated into your dashboard as an editor, personalized feed of this is stuff that's going on right now that's interested in your sports world that you as an editor should be aware of. It allows the editor to have a broader view and craft a 
spoken of also where it relies heavily that this is a content that is really interesting and useful for the adversary. And unless the adversary can be fast on the draw and getting that content in front of the adversary. I think that's a much more nuanced and effective method for using personalization and rich content. I definitely don't want to take <laughs> side <laughs> boots. Let's, side let's be correct. <laughs> no more Kindle Center. <laughs> you don't want to take the human element out of it, right? Because, right. I mean, after all, we're all human. We all want to read stuff from other humans. That's the yeah. point of communicating. Yes. So I, I would completely agree with that. Um, Does that answer your question? Yeah, and it really, but it really does speak to the capabilities here are headline, and he he personalized headline, he headline test, mm -hmm. and if the criteria is click through. And I, again, I'll give you a different example from my world. The the and I'm curious how social media and Facebook and Twitter and those mm -hmm. groups it work with this because in my world they're all the same thing. M in music, there is no the edit the m digital marketing person is wearing so many hats: the digital ad spend, the um, owned media, the social media, mm -hmm. and what's often challenging is that. They want the workflow to be as easy to publish on Twitter as it is on their website. And for Drupal, you mean I have to do A-B testing and this and that. So I, I, I'm starting to think about uh, two ways of handling that, that where we, we do have analysts and some people who do some additional analyst work and bringing them in to augment the digital marketing team that's overtaxed as it is. Mm -hmm. And say, you want to run a test? Let us run a test for you. Give us the content you were going to post out here, and we're going to try some variations for you and report back. It'd be because I, I'm adding basically a human service, even though they could do it themselves, I think this is the crawl phase to get to get them to go, we can do things differently here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I forgot what this, the, the, the B side to that <laughs> was. I think I remember. Can I try and answer? Do you yeah. guys have the patience for this answer? <laughs> Maybe guys. So when you, you, a great example you brought up was Facebook. So not only are audiences fatigued about having irrelevant, outdated, and generated content shoveled their way, but the social audience in general is recognizing this as well. Take Facebook or new Facebook. Facebook has done a remarkable job over the last six months or so of making sure that the content that users see in front of them on Facebook is personalized and sensible and easy to look into. From the perspective of times, we generate an enormous amount of content that we do see circulate through Facebook. And so it is very valuable to us from the perspective of the editorial team that really only has the time to match one new form to the next, that they're able to create a piece of content in CMS, push it out through any distribution mechanism that's been allowed by the producing audience, and do so in a way that's effective for that audience. The headline, for example, that you might want to pin into an article that someone's going to pick up from Facebook is probably different from the headline you're going to want to pin into an article and put on your headline real quick when you're reading it on news, in a newsstand in the airport. And we're, we're able to start to do that. And, and are, is, is that part, you are, uh, uh, well, I got to ask, is that, a, mm -hmm. is that through some of the Lyft products or is that some sort of your workflow? But that's really great because to me, these are, these are separate, these are re repetitive tasks. Right. Log into Facebook, publish here, log into this, log mm -hmm. into that. Well, Our expectation is that as we hit, go from crawl, walk to run, yeah. that when we hit run, it might be some of your really important tech stuff. It's important for us that we're using tools that are easy to use, fast to implement. My expectation is that this was our user and carry it. The technical capabilities of Lyft are important as well. And one of the reasons we're centering that here is that we think we're going to be able to see that as well. So, I, and I, I don't want to, I'm going to, you've reminded me where I was going with this, which was simply that, <laughs> sorry, no, I, I sorry to, <laughs> I hope this is interesting. This is, uh, uh, if it's I, not, we'll buy you all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So with <laughs> there is a part of me that says, you know what Facebook does is all our marketing people put in their Facebook posts and they pray or they buy audience to see it. Mm -hmm. And Facebook determines whether it's relevant or not based on the attention they see. And there's a part of me that, just like we're doing with those hero banners, we're saying let's load them all up and see which one is the winner. When it comes to the other content, the news items, mm -hmm. tour dates, and videos, I kind of want to say load it all up, and the same with email. Mm -hmm. And we'll let the algorithm figure it out, which takes the onus out off of them of the, the marketing person thinking about two different headlines, multiple creative, because it's making their head explode. And I don't know. I think that's mis underutilizing the capabilities of headline testing. Mm -hmm. But in a resource taxed environment, there's an appeal to me of, of following down that trend that Facebook is doing, which is, and even and let's say it's not just Facebook. 
to use by search advertising on, on Google, but they'll, they'll, if you're not getting clicks, you're kind of, they won't take your money. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that, that goes the way I was feeling with that. Yeah, it's sort of an information retrieval problem at that point, right? right? So that's less about content and it's more about information retrieval. If you guys go into your mapping today and you're looking for restaurant dinners, not only do you want it to know that you're in L.A. and not wherever you live if you don't live in L.A., but at this point you expect that. So there's some degree of information retrieval that as audiences we welcome and desire and look forward to. But I think that's different than the editorial use or selection of content and the forms of enriching people when they come into the country to play. Right. Some of so it looks like we've had an uh, audience member patiently waiting. So uh, if you've got a question Thank for us, you. we'd love to hear it. I, I work in healthcare, so I have a question for the gentleman from Pfizer. Um, our user testing has told us that most of the people coming to our site and looking at content are looking for a family member, a parent, a child. So it's not necessarily for them. How do we personalize? How do you personalize for caregivers or parents or, you know? So we have, we have entire sites where a parent or a caregiver is, is the audience, especially if you have a, a pediatric vaccine, for example. The, the entire audience is going to be either going to be a healthcare professional or, or going to be a parent. And I would say we, it, it's, not really, it's not really different apart from uh, many of those websites because of the, the type of content that we have is so, uh, so focused depending on, depending on the use, use case. This is where we've kind of done personalization in in old technologies where you turn up and the first page is, who are you? Like, are you a healthcare professional? Are you a caregiver? Or are you gonna be taking this product yourself? Because the content in the other areas is just completely uh, completely irrelevant. What I'd say is we can completely change our approach to how we build those kind of sites. So rather than having just an information architecture that drives you one of these three ways, we can custom construct those three, or those multiple categories and then this kind of, kind of technology and even pick a hint as to who they are before they arrive rather than having something necessarily informal. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a good example where you have a very, very different type of content depending on the user. So personalization is critical because mm -hmm. show them something that's just completely irrelevant and sometimes completely inappropriate for, for their case. And you start with email to get them there or? It, it depends. So if we know the user, then obviously email is a great, um, is, is a great, great method. And maybe we even know if we have their email address, maybe we, have, we already have some, some data. For these kind of websites, it's really people just turning up. So we might have an idea based on what they're, what they're searching for, for example. It's really gonna be when they've heard about a product that their, their child's gonna have, maybe it's from the immunization schedule or something like that, or it's a, it's a condition that they're searching for for a friend, um, or, or whatever the way. But you can get some idea of, of the actual search results and then personalize them. Thank you. No problem. Great. Well, um, is there any other questions? You got us Mike to tackle this one. This one here. not had issues um, asking for those permissions it's it's and again it's um, so I, in general that's not been an issue uh, well for a, for a while in fact when we first did lot started this capability we we saw the value in, in that social signal that we almost slipped too far, we didn't offer an alternative way to create an account, and then we added traditional login, I would, meaning you want a, an email password combination and no, you know, that's, that's a, depending on the artist and the site, it can vary, but let's just say it's, a, it's about a one in five, prefer to go down that path. Uh, so that's, and then as far as storage, we are um, federating that across all of these, uh, across Universal, and that allows us to do uh, central identification across not only the interstate portfolio sites, but other, uh, other technologies, CMSs, email service providers. And what we're doing with that is basically creating a Lee Hannon profile, his top five artists that can go to the marketing system that can use it. So the exact target can then say, and we can create dynamic custom email there. And I think that in terms of low, 
a walk, run, you, uh, or a crawl, walk. Email is really well suited for personalization in some ways. A lot of the context is easier to talk about multiple artists that don't make sense on LadyGaga.com. And there's no runtime challenge. Uh, I'm going to go through this big, I think you guys are solving the runtime challenges of lots of decision needed to draw that page. But a year or two ago, it was like you, nobody has to wait for that email to be composed. Did I answer the two questions? Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, this is kind of related. It's 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 more an ethical question than anything else. Um, I guess you know, given given social login, the information you have access to with social login, um, I'm I'm not really sure like how much um, of op opting in anymore is really informed consent. Um, so I guess uh, my my question is really, how well do you draw the line at some point between uh, what's kind of creepy and not creepy in terms of of the information you, you gather about about your visitors and like where do you draw that line if that does come up along the way? Uh, Dries actually did a presentation on this in his keynote at, at DrupalCon Latin America, right? And he, he, I think he had a slide which was like the line is don't be creepy. And <laughs> I know that doesn't like define the, define the line, but it's a major consideration here. As, as, as we've got more into this kind of technology and understanding this kind of technology, it's kind of frightening what you can do with it. So it's a, it's a massive consideration as you um, as you implement this kind of technology and being very respectful of the data that you have and making sure that you're using it in a way that's really going to benefit the customer rather than being really creepy. And this is one of the places where I probably say some normally, uh, enormous things would be a global team. About a third of my engineering team comes out of, comes out of London, comes out of Europe. And the perspective on privacy in uh, Europe is very, very different from the perspective on privacy in the U.S. For time, when we think about always is who is our audience what does our audience want from us? How do we help our audience find the information they're looking for, whether it's sports scores or planting or how to paint your living room, for example. And what I find is that consistently, companies that think about audience first and what does this audience want from me or what does this user want from me and how do they want to engage with you in a relationship. So getting to the point where you're providing the opportunity where if they don't want to engage with you through a social login, don't make them engage through a social login. Offer them the opportunity, if they want to build that relationship with you, to be able to come to an email address. And thinking about it from an audience-first perspective and, and about building that long-term relationship with the audience, not just how do I pass you an email address uh, before they pivot from the team, is really important and tends to keep people on track. And I, I was going to say uh, <coughs> that I had a, just an anecdotal conversation when we're illustrating that technology to one of our product managers. Um, and there's a, there's a comp I should preface this, there's a company out there called Songkick. If you've used it, it's, you provide a social signal and it delivers concert alerts to you based on when those artists. It looks at your Facebook likes or your music plays and it's, and, and it's, a, a, it's a pure play around concert information. And I basically, without naming them, I said we can do that with albums and merchandise. And we take the signal coming from Facebook or this, and the product manager goes, that's creepy. And I said, yeah, that's creepy. What do you think about Songkick? And she said, oh, I love Songkick. So, you know, I, I do think it's uh, personalization is a service. It does involve some intrusion. And I think you are trying to, you have to present it as a service. And while we don't have all the, probably not as much polling and resources as time, every time we do a, a personalized target email, uh, open rates go up, and more importantly, opt-out rates pretty much go to zero. Nobody feels like that message is not relevant to them or stop telling me about this. I can tell you the anonymous emails where you're on a mailing list and they tell you about 20 things, and it, it has just got big opt-out rates. Stop telling me the, about stuff I don't care about. So it, I think, um, and I think things are, people are maturing to where they expect personalization. Mm -hmm. So And people are maturing to where they aren't creepy about it. The other day I was in of Slack, or I'm sure lots of you here use Slack, and somebody had decided to spam every Slack chat with this type of post, post like seriously, that I mean that that was not useful or personalized or, or thoughtful for me as a Slack user, and we, we all sort of have those kind of problems with our with our Slack and how do we evolve as folks? Good question. So my question was around uh, tools and also make versus buy. So which tools uh, did you folks evaluate? when you were thinking about personalization uh, and, uh, and what was the process and 
what did you eventually, eventually end up selecting? So, so we got quite excited about personalization and A-B testing when we started the digital platform. So as you mentioned, that was, that was three years ago. So we were, we were into it. It was one of the things on, on the list of people might be interested in this. And we tried, to, we tried a couple of tests with one consumer brand in the US where we, we took um, a multivariate, A-B multivariate testing tool and then tried to implement, implement it with this brand. And it was separate from the content management system. So it was the same. I was, I was, I was going down the path of give these guys access to sell their content at the same time as let's try and personalize it in a separate tool. And creating and publishing content is not easy. It, it just isn't. Creating and publishing regulated content is, is, is hard as well. And when you have your content needs to be distributed across many different systems, it becomes impossible. It's just, it's, 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 it's so, so hard to do. So we did this experiment and it kind of worked as in, like the results in the A-B test were, were, were good, but it was so hard to achieve it that we kind of put that back on, back on, on the shelf. And it wasn't until much later on when we were working with Acquia and, and then there was lots of conversation about, I think Acquia called that like a shadow CMS, we've got content here and content there. Mm -hmm. And when we, when we learned and had discussions about the fact that uh, the, content, uh, the content creation workflow can be this very same workflow that we're, we're pushing mm -hmm. content through with, with Lou into the platform in the first place, it was like, okay, it's time now, we can actually do this and this is, this is gonna be possible. So we've been kind of you know, partnering with Acquia on that journey with, with Lyft as that tools become available, then implementing it within that same same workflow. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I have a Especially in the pharma environment with the website, um, you guys are so highly regulated with what you can say and what you can't say. Um, how are you getting past that to do personalization? Because from my experience, you gotta go through a two week regulatory review before anything <coughs> can change on your website. So, and then how do you get that submitted past um, that area? If, if, our, if our regulatory processes were two weeks, I think we'd be very, very happy with that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 could be, they could be many, many months to, at times. And it's, it's, it's a key question to our success here. And what, I, what I'd say is when we're implementing this technology, it's not just about picking a technology and, and then putting it in place. You've got to look at the entire picture of what needs to happen in order for a user to, to use it. And like I said, creating and publishing content is hard. Creating and publishing content in the regulated in industry, as you said, is very, very hard. And it was, it was I, I see this as the same challenge as we had when we went down the path of responsive web design. Because everybody was expecting a website that looked like this, and that was approved, and that was fine. And then suddenly you, you look at it across different devices, and it looks very different. And that was difficult for us to, to get our, our legal team to understand and, and figure out that the web, you can't change this. The website is going to look different on different devices and get tooling in place to be able to support the approval, knowing that some very important things like this text is no longer right next to this text, it's below it. Um, make sure we're all comfortable with exactly what's happening there. And that requires some tooling to make that, to make that work. Um, we're doing the same thing with, with personalization. So we're, we're investing in some tooling um, to get ahead of this because it's going to be critical. We can't say, hey, this, here's your tool, go create five different versions of this content, we're going to mash it up and expect that to be a responsible thing to do. There's, there's a lot of work behind making that happen. That's part of our whole personalization journey that, that, that we're on with. Uh, we're, it, this is actually back to kind of the, I heard the kind of build versus, the build versus buy discussion earlier on. This is something we're, we're building um, for ourselves because it's, 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 it's a very hard problem to solve. We're, we're making some, some positive progress. I, I, I did, like I said, I met, spent some time with your team last night, and it would be amazing to me that Chapstick or, or Fi I don't know, other FISA products have so much in common with Lady Gaga and Eminem, because <laughs> um, your scrutiny, even the, forget the regulation, you have strong brand management about <laughs> protecting the brand. Yep. And they're used to approving this is it, not these variations are it. And when I demoed these capabilities with Lyft, and personalization, my product managers, again, we're emissaries. We are one part of the ecosystem. So I, we manage Lady Gaga and FNM, but there's a manager and so they're like, okay, I've got to go to the manager and get them to approve this. And so we're all looking at this workflow as being a challenge, but I do think that's where we are today. It, you go a year out and it's like, I'm gonna hear, why don't we have this now? Or why can't we do it, you know, we're just, Everybody's going to expect it, and the, and the forward-leaning managers know this. They know that 
there's testing and you're targeting to all other parts of the, the ecosystem on Facebook, Twitter, Connor. So they, they, they get it whenever, before I haven't even finished the sentence. They're going to read it. But there are other people who are saying, I don't want to get this hit list. And we have the same issue with responsive. Yep. Yeah, it, and you can't, you can't ignore these things, right? So, so with the true story on responsive is when, when we first moved to Drupal, we installed the Drupal uh, on, on one site at the very beginning. We had to install the Drupal module mobile tools. And people might remember this is the this is the module when you had the m.websites. It would it would redirect you if you were on a mobile device. And we used this module to redirect people on a mobile device to a page that said, "Please don't access this, or you can't access this page on a mobile device," <laughs> because the lawyers were uncomfortable with with how responsive was placed, and it was for some for some sensible reasons. It's the kind of response, but just not the response. It's <laughs> responsive, <laughs> right? It's, it, 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 you have the spectrum what we're talking about here, giving the user a great customer experience. I didn't think that people probably don't think you could get that far down the other end of the scale of what we're doing to our users in, in, in that case. So that's where we had to, it was, it, was, it was great for us coming to personalization, going through that experience of, we, we, we don't get to say no to this. We don't, we don't get to switch this off for the internet. We've got to make this work. We had to solve the problem. It was a hard problem to solve and we solved it. And it, it didn't, it meant that when we were talking about personalization, this was top of mind of how we're we gonna deal with this. And we were, we're kind of doing this journey at the same time, but you can't put personalization in. I think this is, it's, I, I don't know across other industries, but in the regulated industry, it's very, very difficult. So that's why we've had to kind of in parallel with going, okay, it's much easier now with the personalization tooling being part of the CMS to implement that. We've been, okay, let's go solve this other hard problem that we can maybe have to solve for ourselves as we haven't been at the, the market as strong as we can be solutions for this. I think the, the trick there is, and the trick with, our, with, with the platform has been, uh, it's, it's, I, I like to say it's been 100% carrot and 0% stick, right? So we didn't get, we, we didn't say, okay, Pfizer have 60 content management systems. We have this like tool to say, it makes sense for us to consolidate this. You must do this. That wouldn't have worked, right? We've convinced ourselves it was the right thing to do, but it wouldn't have worked. So our success has been based on the fact that the brand teams want to come and work with us. So we have to be very focused on not checking the box and saying, hey, you've got personalization now, but give it to them in a way that actually works, which means you need to consider the entire, the entire process. And there's sometimes there's gaps in that process that you've got to go and, and innovate to, to flood. All right, we're almost at the end of the allotted time here. So I just wanted to pause to see if anyone else has any additional final thoughts or questions. Otherwise, I guess we can, uh, we can wrap up. Yeah, go ahead. You can't do the, we were talking about the, like the cross-property thing. Um, you need a third par party cookie to make that work. And in Europe, most countries, you have to have an opt-in, have a third party cookie, which means users don't opt-in and don't say yes, which means unless you set, set things up properly, you've got nothing, right? You've got no statistics on the user. And I think it's good to, to, to kind of have that in Europe when you kind of, if you're building a global platform, to be mindful of what, what is and isn't proven to the other markets as well. Right? There's a good reason why people are saying, like, don't be doing this, because you have no idea that you're doing that, um, to, to, to make sure that you can be as responsible on your side. I think we started with this thought. We're very respectful of it, uh, the current platform. It's something that we're now working into our roadmap, so even when we're looking at cross-sleep, people still need to have to be responsive to what we're trying to do. Uh, mostly worry about the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will... <laughs> What's funny to me anecdotally is I've had these tough conversations with uh, Germany, which is one of the most strict, about what we can do. And then I go to their properties and I see Facebook widgets and Twitter widgets and follow and like. And so I, I just am sometimes frustrated that, that you know, they're delivering data to Facebook and Twitter and not to the company or the property they're trying to market with. But that's, I understand the reality that it's just.